thank the organizers for the privilege of speaking to this audience and also for all the work of putting on uh, an event like this, which is fantastic. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to speak to you about uh, my work today. I'm going to slightly change the subject uh, compared to what's been talked about mostly today and yesterday. Rather than focus on the brain per se, I'm going to focus actually on the sense of vision and the retina. The retina, as you all know, is a sheet of neural tissue at the rear of the eye. It's what the eye doctor looks at when they're trying to assess your visual health. The retina sends visual information to a variety of targets deep in the brain and initiates the process of vision. What I'm going to tell you about today is our efforts to develop an artificial retina, an electronic implant that can replace the function of retinas damaged by disease. Now, why would we want to do that? There are two <clears throat> main reasons, one very practical and one perhaps more forward-looking. First, of course, loss of vision can be a debilitating disorder, and in fact, it can have profound influence on economic productivity as well as social isolation. And although we have good tools for replacing visual functions, we would think that after decades of neuroscience research and understanding vision, we should be able to actually restore vision <clears throat> rather than replace it. Along those lines, if we think about it, the retina really is the best understood neural circuit in the central nervous system by a long way. And that's, in fact, been true for over 100 years. So as we think about the ability to create electronic devices that truly restore our function, this seems like an awfully good place to start. So what is an, ele an electronic implant to restore vision or an artificial retina, and how could it work? Well, the concept is simple, and it's not our concept. We weren't the first to come up with it. In normal vision, the photoreceptor cells at the rear of the retina capture light and transform that light into electrical signals. Those signals are then processed by extensive circuitry within the retina and terminate on the so-called retinal ganglion cells. These are the output neurons of the retina that send visual information deep into many targets in the brain. But in some disorders, notably retinitis pigmentosa and macular degeneration, the photoreceptor cells at the rear of the retina are lost. And as a consequence, we lose our light sensitivity. The concept for vision restoration with an electronic implant is simple. Perhaps we can bypass those photoreceptors, capture the image with a camera, and then use that to electrically stimulate the ganglion cells with an implant, causing them to have electrical activity that they send to their normal brain targets. And you can imagine, of course, that if we do this effectively, we may be able to send naturalistic visual signals to the places they're supposed to go and initiate the process of vision. Unfortunately, however, the devices that have been developed to do this kind of thing, although they involved heroic efforts and gave initial promising results, provide very, very limited vision restoration with poorly controlled percepts that are hard to understand and do anything with. Why is that? Well, I would argue that a primary reason why we haven't yet developed high-quality retinal implants is that we've left a lot of science on the table. In fact, all retinal implants that have been developed today use none of the information that we have gleaned since the founding of the National Eye Institute in 1968, really. There's a lot of science just not included in current technologies, and we aim to fix that. So what is it about the science that can help us understand how to develop a high-quality retinal implant that can restore high-fidelity visual sensations? Well, the, the last couple of decades of research have painted an extremely clear picture of the complexity of the retinal circuitry. There are dozens of different cell types within the retina that have distinct morphology or shapes and sizes, distinct connectivity to one another, distinct visual functioning properties, and even distinct patterns of projection into the brain. So the retina is nothing like a simple pixel detector or camera. It's an interleaved collection of, say, 20 or so distinct neural circuits that transmit visual information to a variety of central targets to initiate this process of vision. 
So what do we need to know about the different cell types and what they're doing in order to restore visual function? Well, a lot of that has been developed by some of the work in my lab, building on the shoulders of out other outstanding scientists who have studied the retina for many years. And to illustrate that, I'm showing a slide of recordings from our lab from the macaque monkey retina with large-scale multi-electrode electrical recording. Each cell out of several hundred simultaneously recorded is represented by its visual receptive field, or the region of visual space to which it responds to light. The different cells, several hundred of them simultaneously recorded, are separated out for convenience here, but in fact they're all on top of one another and, and mixed in with one another in the retinal circuitry. We see that as we look at the different cell types, each has a very distinctive pattern of temporal response, a very distinctive spatial sensitivity, and a very distinctive pattern of electrical firing statistics. It's striking. Each of the cell types is remarkably homogeneous within a type. But as you look across types, it couldn't be more different. So the picture I want you to hold in your minds of how the retina works based on recent findings is it's one that looks like this schematically. There are many different cell types. They send information to the brain in distinctive patterns of electrical activity. Those patterns of electrical activity are transmitted to a variety of central targets. And somehow, this initiates the process of vision. So somehow, to restore visual function, we need to be able to reproduce these distinct patterns in the different cell types, obviously. OK, but there's a huge problem, which is that the different cell types are not conveniently separated out for us in the retinal surface. Instead, they're all mixed up with one another on the surface of the retina. What this means is that if you make a simple, naive device that involves simply taking a grid of electrodes and passing the pixels in and controlling the current on the grid of electrodes, you can't possibly produce these distinctive patterns of activity in the different cell types that are necessary for visual function. So what could we do to restore these naturalistic patterns of activity? We, have a, we are developing a device that operates in three simple ways that are conceptually very straightforward. The first step <clears throat> of the artificial retina is to record spontaneous electrical activity using a grid of electrodes to figure out what the cells are, where they're located in the retina that we're implanting. The second step is to stimulate and record with that same grid of electrodes, just the way we do in the lab, in order to figure out which electrodes activate which cells and by how much. And then having obtained this calibration information, when we receive a visual image, we translate with this information into the patterns of activity that we need to create and the stimulation that we need to pass through the electrodes to create those patterns of activity. I want to emphasize that this is a fundamentally bidirectional view of interfacing to the nervous system. And no device like this has been created in any part of the nervous system. We call this device the Stanford Artificial Retina, and it involves many types of technology development, including leaning heavily on the basic science that I told you about, algorithms for stimulation, chips for low power recording and stimulation on the retinal surface, wireless data and, tra and power transfer, penetrating electrodes to get closer to the cells, and surgical hardware to allow stable implantation on the surface of the retina. How well could this work? Well, we think it could work quite well based on actual recording and stimulation in the macaque and human retina ex vivo from collections of hundreds of cells, such as the cells shown here from an actual recording. With stimulation and recording, we can infer the quality of the visual signal that we can reproduce with this small collection of cells. We then expect that when a person is viewing with this device, as they move their eyes around the scene, we stimulate appropriately at the different locations in order that they can sort of stitch together a representation of the visual scene that will be useful to them. Now, what does all this technology development imply about other types of brain interfaces? We think it implies a lot, based on the fundamental structural similarity between the retina and all brain circuits. We know this about all brain circuits. Each circuit consists of many different cell types. They have different lamination patterns, different morphologies. They receive inputs from different parts of the brain and send outputs to different parts of the brain, and they function differently. This is common to all neural circuits. In the retina, where we understand better than it works anywhere else, we're now able to start to reproduce those patterns of activity. We think the implications are strong for being able to develop other types of 
brain implants that can likewise record, transform, and stimulate, and thereby speak the neural code of the tissue in which it's embedded. In our discussion today, I'd love to talk with you about these aspects of brain mach machine interfaces of the future. And a couple of topics that are primary on my mind that I'd enjoy speaking with you about are, first of all, our first in human test, which we hope to achieve in the next year or two. We're very familiar with technology development and experimentation, but these preclinical things are new to us, and I'd be happy to have discussions about that. And the second is discussion about partners who may be interested in translating this technology into future high-resolution, high-fidelity brain-machine interfaces. As I said, I think the implications are high, and we intend to continue focusing on the retina because that's our area of expertise. But if you'd like to talk about translating to other areas of the brain, I'd love to have a conversation about that. Thanks for your time.